Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. And I know uh, y'all don't usually do this, but if you would not mind, if you would please stand for the reading of God's holy word to give reverence to the Lord our God and His word. Again, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Hear now the word of the living God. Therefore, while the promise of entering His rest still remains, let us, fe- let us fear, lest any of us should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As He said, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in in this passage he said, They shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again he appoints a certain day today saying that through, through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us strive, therefore, to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of whom to whom we have to do. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us again, Lord. We ask that you would be with us this morning. Lord, we have heard your word read, and we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and work in our hearts that you would meet us where we are, that we would hear a word from God and not from man, that you would speak to us, that you would move in our hearts, and we ask that you would meet with us this morning. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. And children under five are uh, dismissed if you would like. There there are adults downstairs to take care of them. Um, But if not, um, most of us can relate to the idea of resting after a long trip. Now, many of us have taken long trips on vacations. Maybe you went to go see a natural wonder of the world. Maybe you went to go see the Grand Canyon or something else like Mount Rushmore or something like that. Uh, maybe you've taken the long trip to the beach. Well, it's not so long in Charleston to go to the beach. It's longer in Clover when you preach this. But maybe you've taken the long trip to Disney World. And as soon as you get to the hotel, the beach house, the monument, wherever you're going, especially if you're the one driving, you just kind of want to rest. You kind of want to lay down on the bed for just four seconds and take a breath. Uh, Since we've had our son, I have uh, understood that far more than I ever did. But when you walk in, you want to dump your luggage, rest, and just take it easy. See, the idea of rest is something that is often foreign to us in our day and in our time. A rest is something that we really only understand on vacations. But a main point of the scripture, and a main point of what Christ has come to give us, is in fact rest. Uh, this morning, we'll see that Christ has come to give us a greater rest. We see the promise of what we'll see. Uh, we will see the promise of greater rest. That the word reveals our hearts, and we will see our great high priest. First, in this passage, we see the promise of a greater rest. Look with me at verses 1 through 10 if you have your Bibles. The author of Hebrews has just spoken in chapter 3 about how Christ is greater than Moses, about how the rebellious people in the wilderness did not continue in faith and they did not enter into God's rest. 
He is there speaking of the promised land, the land of Canaan. And there he says that those that were not faithful, they did not enter the rest, but those that did, those that were faithful and continued in faith, they entered into God's rest. So he starts in chapter 4 saying that the promise of rest still remains. And then he gives us a warning. If you look in verse 1, he tells us that the promise of rest of God that was given to the Israelites, that was reminded uh, to the people of David's day in Psalm 95, that promise still stands. And since it does, we should fear. We should fear lest any of us should fail to enter that rest. He is telling us, well, it brings up a question in our minds. How can you fail to reach the rest of God? How is that something that you can fail to attain? He has already told us in chapter 3, verse 19, that it is through unbelief that the rebels in the wilderness failed to enter. And he tells us again in verse 2, he says that good news came to those the same as it has come to us, but they were not united in faith to those who believed. In other words, they did not believe the promise that God had given to them of rest. So they were unable to enter the rest of God. You remember the story. The spies go into the promised land and they come back. Only And only Caleb and Joshua give a good report. Two out of twelve give a good report. The people believe the bad report. The, they believe the report that the land is flowing with milk and honey, but the people there are as giants and we are as grasshoppers and there's no way we can take the land. So God punishes them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until the entire generation dies, except for Joshua and Caleb. They're the, only, they're the only members of that generation that enter the promised land. And he says the same danger of unbelief that was the danger there is the danger here. That we are able to miss the rest of God by not believing in his promises. The Hebrews that he's writing to are tempted to go back to the old Jewish religion, the old Jewish system. And he's telling them that if you do that, if you go back, and if you do not believe in Christ, you have forfeited your rest, your share in the rest that God is promising. He goes on and he says that there remains a rest for the people of God. He says in verses 3 and 4 that God rested from his works in Genesis 2-2. But in Psalm 95-11, the psalmist David writes to the people of his day, They shall not enter my rest. And he makes his point in verse 6. He says, there remains a rest for the people of God. See, we are able to believe the good news, the gospel of Christ, and we are able to rest, to enter into the rest of God. But those who refuse, those who uh, refuse to believe, they fail to enter it. The people of David's day, he warns the people that hundreds of years after the Exodus, that today, if you hear God's voice, do not harden your heart like the rebels did. Do not turn away and be unbelieving. The point of all of this is that God is inviting you and me, all of us, into the Sabbath rest that He enjoys that began on the seventh day of creation. See, this is the rest that we enter whenever we die. Whenever we go to heaven, we rest from our works. And it is the fellowship that we have with the triune God today on the earth. You don't just get the rest when you die. You get it now. If we trust in Christ, we are able to rest in Him. The author makes the, the further point in verse 8, in verses 8 through 10. He says in verse 8 that if Joshua had given them rest, then God would not have spoken of another rest later on. He's saying that the rest that God is talking about is not the promised land. It is, it is not the land of Canaan. In fact, if it is, then there's no need to continue to promise rest. Because the people already went into the promised land. In fact, he's, doing a, he's actually doing a play on words here. You can't really see it in English. Uh, English is a fine language, but it's not Greek. And the New Testament was written in Greek. Uh, but that's all right. Your Bibles are very trustworthy. But the, what, what he is doing is, in Greek, it reads this. If you look at verse 8, in Greek it would say this. If Jesus had given them rest. Because our Lord and Savior's name, Jesus, is Joshua. In Hebrew. And in Greek, it's Jesus. So around the house, Mary might have called him 
Joshua. But his name is Jesus. So the point of all of that, of me telling you all of that, is this. The Joshua of the Old Testament is a type and a shadow, a figure, of the Joshua of the New Testament, Jesus, who came to give us greater rest. You see, Joshua didn't lead the people into lasting rest because they failed to take the full possession of the Promised Land. And not only that, but they lost it when God exiled them because of their idolatry and because of their sin. But Jesus Christ has come and given us rest, true rest. He tells us that the Sabbath rest remains for the people of God, and if we enter into that rest, we rest from our works as God has rested from His. It is in Christ, through faith in Him, that we are able to rest in God and to walk in that rest until He returns and we get full possession of it in heaven and when Christ returns. Have you ever come back from a vacation and needed a vacation? You ever got home and you were, well, you were relaxing on a beach and then you came home? And then you have a project to do at your house. You have to catch up on all the work that you missed while you were gone. And at some point, you may have had the thought, why did I go on vacation? I now need another vacation. Because you have so much work when you get home. The problem is, our rest isn't continual. It isn't complete. It always has an end. See, we rest for a while, and then we go home, and we go back to work. In the same way, the people of Israel did not inherit rest with the Promised Land, because it pointed to a greater rest that we have in Christ, ultimately in the new creation when He returns. So are you resting in Christ? You know, I've been asked before in my ministry, uh, why do we come to church on Sunday? I've been asked that by youth, by children, by adults, by a lot of people. Aside from it being the day our Lord rose from the dead, and aside from Him commanding us to come to church on Sunday, from gathering together with His people, it's a practice of rest with Christ forever. Sunday is not a day for us. It's not a day for our hobbies, for our entertainment, or anything like that. It's the one day a week that we set aside for rest and worship of God. It is, uh, the Bible is very clear that we are to rest in God by worshiping, worshiping Him, by spending the whole day with His people, in His house, hearing His Word taught. Our lives are so overly programmed by everything, by sports, by school, by work, by events, by hobbies, by meetings, and so many other things that I could sit up here and mention, that we have forgotten how to rest. And rest is not just sitting on the couch and vegging out. That's not all rest is. It's being with God and being with His people. It's practicing for our new life with Him in the new creation. This is what we were made for. And it's what we were saved for. We were saved to be together with God's people. Sometimes we are so focused on this life and everything that's going on that we miss the rest of Christ. And sometimes we can miss it so much in this life that we will miss it in the next. John Calvin said, The highest human good is therefore simply union with God. Let us not miss our highest good, union with Christ. Rest with Him for all these things that will leave us tired and worn down. So we see the promise of greater rest. And secondly, we see the Word reveals our hearts. Look with me at verse 11. Again, the author of Hebrews gives a warning to the people he's writing to, and he gives it to us as well. He says that we are to strive to enter God's rest and to not fail by the same sort of disobedience. Now, the author of Hebrews is not telling us that we are able to lose our salvation in Christ. He isn't saying that we have to earn our rest with God either. Rather, he is saying that real faith is continually, as it is continually pre presented in the Scripture and in the book of Hebrews, is faith that continues. Faith that continues until we die. You see, faith is not ha something you can have today and, you, and it vanishes tomorrow in three weeks or in four years. Faith is something that we have, and it continues throughout our life. Faith in Christ is given to us as a gift by the Holy Spirit, and it grows throughout our life. Now, faith is something that perseveres throughout our life. It's not easy. It's not always strong. It's not always the best. But it is something that grows and continues. The author is saying that we must continue in obedience to the Lord, and we are not able to walk in disobedience to Him 
and still claim the rest of God. Another commentator, F.F. F. Bruce, he puts it this way, and he puts it uh, better than I can. He says, God is not to be trifled with. His word cannot be ignored with impunity, but must be received in faith and obeyed in daily life. His and the author of Hebrews' point is this, that faith is a continuous walk of obedience until we reach the goal. He isn't saying that you have to have perfect obedience. He's saying that we must have genuine obedience. There's a vast difference between being perfect and being genuine. None of us are perfect. All of us can be genuine believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. He moves on in verse 12 to talk about why we must have this genuine obedience and continuance in faith. It's because the Word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is not like the words of men that can be ignored without consequence. It is alive and it works in the hearts and lives of the people. Every time that it is spoken. Every time that it is read. Isaiah 55, 11, it says, that teaches us that God's word does not return void. Every time it goes out, it either softens a heart or it hardens a heart. The Holy Spirit is always working through the word of God in all the people that hear it. The purposes of God's word are always accomplished whenever it is sent out, whenever it is sent out. The Word is not only living, but it's active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. That's meaning a sword that cuts both ways. It's able to divide between soul and spirit, joint and marrow, to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The, the author of Hebrews is not trying to tell us uh, the anatomies of our soul or our body or anything like that. He is making a point that like the double-edged dagger of Ehud in Judges, the Word of God is able to make a sharp and precise cut to the heart, to the very core of who you and I are. It shows our sin plainly, and it makes known to us the secrets of our heart that are lurking in the deepest and the darkest places. It shows whether our obedience to God is genuine or whether we're just here to get people off our backs. Uh, we might think that the secret intentions of our heart are not known, but they are. That they're hidden from everyone else around us. But the Word of God makes it plain to us as it cuts us like a razor-sharp sword. Not only are these things revealed by the Word, but there's also nothing that's hidden from God. Look at verse 13. It says that there is no creature that is hidden from His sight. That just as His Word is piercing, the sight of God is piercing as well. He looks into the deepest parts of who we are and He knows us. He knows us and He has known us for all time. Think about that. God has known how terrible we are and the worst parts of who we are from all time. And He has still loved us. The idea is clear here that we are naked and exposed before to Him who we have to do. We are to continue in genuine obedience to the Lord by faith, not because we're trying to earn our way to God, but because every thought, every action, every motivation, everything that we do they're seen by God. Now you can hide from your friends and from your family. You can hide from the preacher. But you can't hide from God. See, we cannot fool God into thinking we are obeying Him from the heart and following Him if we're not. We can't trick the one who has seen us laid bare before Him. So let us continue in faith and obedience to Him, knowing that He knows all things and that He has still brought us to Himself. So there are a few universal experiences, I think, in life. I believe one of them is getting in trouble as a child. We have all gotten in trouble as children. Uh, you've uh, maybe had the same experience I have, that you, are trying to, that you are doing something that your parents told you not to do. And then uh, your parent is confronting you about it. And you have all of the excuses, all of the right things to say to convince them that you weren't doing what they thought uh, you were doing. And then they said the words, I've been watching you the whole time. And then you just kind of hung your head and took your punishment. Because there was nothing more you could say. They knew everything you were doing. That's happened to me more than once in my life. All I could do was take my punishment and ask for forgiveness. See, often we try to hide our sin from God. Uh, but there's nothing to hide. There's no, there's no way to hide. We're trying to hide from someone who sees all things. 
who sees everything. When we stop to think about it, we realize how crazy it is, but we do it. So we can't hide from Him. He knows our hearts. This morning, the Word of God has worked in your heart and it's worked in mine. We have either been hardened to the truth of Christ or we have recognized who He is, the reality of His Word, and we are being brought closer to Him. Are we trying to hide from God? This morning, are we here because we think that if we hide in plain sight, it will be better for us? Beloved, He knows. He sees it. He knows the sins that we're trying to hide from Him, to put in the darkness where He can't find them. He knows when we only act like a Christian around our friends, around our family, around the preacher. He knows when we think that what we have done has escaped His eyes and that He'll never find out. Why try to hide? If we live our lives like we cannot hide from God, we won't have anything to hide from God. If we remember that Christ sees everything and has still loved us, we won't try to hide or try to pass off fake obedience as a relationship with Christ. This morning, if you have never come to faith in Christ, if you have never turned to Him, then repent of your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. If you do know Christ, then live in genuine obedience to Him, not, uh, not trying to make the people around you impress with your righteousness, but seeking to be cut by the Word of God, repenting daily for your sins, and living before the face of the One that sees all things and the One to whom we have to give an account. So we see the promise of a greater rest that the Word reveals our hearts. And lastly, we see the great high priest. Look at verses 14 through 16. So after telling us all of this, after hearing that we cannot hide from the Lord because the Word of God reveals everything, he says that we have a great high priest that has passed through the heavens who is the Son of God himself. And so we are to hold fast to our confession. See, the author of Hebrews is telling us that we are able to enter into the rest by holding fast to our belief, our faith in Christ. Not because of our effort, but because a great high priest has gone into the heavens. You remember the high priests of the Old Testament? They ministered in the tabernacle and in the temple. And on one day of the year, the Day of Atonement, they would offer uh, a sacrifice. And they would take it into uh, the most holy place. But they were only humans. They were sinful men like we are. And we are here reminded that the high priest, that our high priest, ministers in heaven before the throne of God. And that he is not just a man, though he is fully man, but he is the son of God himself. See, the one who speaks to God on our behalf is not a son of Aaron. He is the son of God. He is able to sympathize with us as well. And that is one thing that makes him, that's another thing that makes him a great high priest. That he is able to sympathize with our weakness. But again, you should be thinking of a question. How is a perfect person able to sympathize with my weakness as a sinful person? How can Jesus sympathize with me? How can he know what it is like to be tempted? Well, the author, the author he answers that question. He says that Jesus has been tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. Now, Jesus, during his life on the earth, was not without temptation. He did not, while he didn't have a sinful nature, as we do, he wasn't tempted by sinful desires because he had no sinful desires. Jesus has felt greater temptation than you and I will ever feel. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by Satan himself, and he faced Satan down. But the temptation did not stop there. It was throughout his life to sin, to give in, but he never gave in. If you can imagine two people with their arms stretched out, pushing against each other, eventually someone's going to get tired and someone's going to give in. Someone's going to stop resisting and they're going to fall over and they're going to get hurt. But they'll have rest, they'll have relief from the temptation, from the struggle. That's how Jesus was, but he never gave in. See, you and I, we give in all the time. We feel the struggle all the time and we give in. We feel the struggle from within and we give in. While Jesus never had the struggle from within, he always had the struggle from without, from outside himself. And he never found relief from giving in. You see, we are also in a constant struggle with our sin, against our sinful nature, against temptations from the outside of us and inside, and the Holy Spirit pushes back. But like I said, sometimes we give in, and we do sin and find relief, even though we'll probably get hurt, and we have guilt from the sin. 
See, it is a good thing to know that this sinless person had constant temptation and never gave in to it. So he knows exactly what it is like to be tempted. While he doesn't know what it's like to sin, he, know what it is, he knows what it is like to suffer great temptation. So we can go to him and speak to him. The author of Hebrews also says that because of all of this, because Jesus can sympathize with our weaknesses, that we are able to go boldly to the throne of grace and receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. See, we must remember that when we come to the throne of God, when we are asking for help, we are not coming to the judgment seat of God. We're coming to the mercy seat. See, we're not coming before God and He is going to cast judgments on us. If we have trusted in Christ, then, he, then we come to Him as children, to a loving Father, a Father who cares for us. One that we are able to bring every need, every concern, every temptation to, and we will receive help from Him. The high priests on the Day of Atonement, as I said, they went into the most holy place. And there was the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant, with two cherubim on it, was the lid. The lid had a special name. It was called the mercy seat. And the uh, high priest would take a sacrifice. And they would go in and they would sprinkle blood on the top of the Ark of the Covenant seven times. To make atonement for the people's sin. Jesus, in His sacrifice, in His death, life, death, and resurrection has made the throne of God, the judgment seat of God, a mercy seat for you and for me. And we are able to go and to receive mercy because of our great high priest. So we should run to that throne. You know, all of us speak to our parents in very specific ways. Hopefully very respectful ways, but we all speak to them in very specific ways that nobody speaks to our parents the same way that we do. Except for our siblings. They're the only ones besides us that have the right to speak to our parents that way. We have nicknames that our parents have given us. Uh, we have years of a relationship that we have with them. That causes us to speak to them in a special way. My father works in a machine shop in Gastonia, North Carolina. He's the safety manager there, so he has an office. And when I go into the shop to see him, to eat lunch with him, I don't really... Uh, it might sound disrespectful. It's not, a promise. I don't knock on the door. I kind of just walk in. Sort of like when you go home to your parents' house and you kind of just walk in because it's your house too. But I just walk in and I sit down and I start talking to my dad. And I've noticed that everybody else comes up and they, they knock on the door. They say, hey, Tim, do you have a minute? Can I talk to you? And if not, then they don't get to talk to my dad. But see, me and my brother, we have unfettered, un, unrestricted access to my dad. In the same way, through Christ, through his work, we are children of a loving Father. And we are able to confidently, not arrogantly, but confidently, as children, ask the Lord for help. And since He loves us as a Father loves His children, He helps us. This week, have you felt the struggle of temptation? Are you beaten down uh, by the battle against your sin? And do you feel like there is no one that knows the way you feel? Well, there is someone. The Lord Jesus Christ faced greater temptation than we ever felt, and He overcame it. He overcame it not only to save us, but to bring us into the rest of God. To help us continue in our faith. You are not called to continue in faith alone. But with the help of Christ and through the Holy Spirit. We are called, we are told to ask from God, from the mercy seat of God. Mercy and grace and we will receive it. You have everyone here in God's church to help you continue in faith. That's why that's one reason why God gave us the church. Do not try to live as a Christian on your own. You will fail and you will fall. But trust in your high priest who has redeemed you and who can sympathize with you and who lives to help you in your time of need. Ask for help. Again, don't, don't, if you do not know Christ, come to faith in Christ and you will receive the rest of Christ and you will receive his help. This morning, again, we are presented with rest. Rest from our sins. Rest from trying to fake our way through life. Rest from hiding who we are from God. And rest from trying to live this life by ourselves. Christ has come to bring us into communion with God so that we can have His Sabbath rest. Will you receive it? Will you live in that rest? Or will you work yourself until you are broken and alone and even in hell itself? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray.